fewer than 40 hours of oxygen remaining. So could this be a rescue mission impossible? Well, the remains of a Titanic, where some are speculated the sub could be stuck, rests 12,500 feet beneath the surface of the Atlantic. At that depth, no light from the sun reaches the ocean floor. It's pitch black. Temperatures are near freezing, around 0 to 3 degrees Celsius. Water pressure is 380 times greater than on land. That's the equivalent of being trapped under a 100-storey tower made of lead. And to illustrate just how deep it is, 12,500 feet is about nine Empire State buildings stacked on top of, in, of each other. Well, joining me now are explorer and friend of British businessman Hamish Harding, uh, Yannick Mickelson, retired US Navy submarine captain David Markey, and Dr Michael Yeen, who's a journalist who became the first TV correspondent in history to report from the wreck of the Titanic. Well, welcome to all of you. Um, Yannick, let me, let me start with you, Yannick, uh, if I may. Obviously, a devastatingly difficult time for you and everybody who knows any of these five people on board. How are you feeling about this? Because obviously, Hamish, a great explorer, done many very risky things in his time. But this, as time goes on, does look to be potentially like a, a real tragedy unfurling. It's looking bleak. I'm terrified for the worst news now. It's. Um... I have a little bit of hope, but they have all the odds against them at this point, and it will be a miracle if they can recover the submarine or submersible with a crew that's alive. What, what kind of man is Hamish, for those who don't know him? Hamish is larger than life. Uh, he loves exploration. He's been to space. He's been to the deepest point of the planet. He's been to the South Pole. And he's also mentored me a lot in my career as an explorer, and this is why I'm living close to the North Pole to train to be a polar explorer and survive in the polar climate. There are videos of, I think, Hamish and others talking about this, this vessel, this submersible. The thing that struck me was that for people who were so wealthy, it, it doesn't seem a particularly sophisticated piece of machinery, that the risks are pretty high, actually, if something was to go wrong. Would that be a fair assessment? I myself haven't seen this submersible, but with any expedition, there's a large amount of risk involved. If you want to be the first person to do something today on planet Earth or in space, you have to accept risk because if it was easy, it wouldn't have been done. Um, David, you've been a re retired United States Navy submarine captain, so an expert in this field. I want to play a little bit of what I was just talking about, a little clip of uh, some of the people who are on board talking before about it, including Hamish an experimental submersible vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub seemed improvised. We can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> so, David... Look, they're sort of being quite jokey about it. Obviously, this is now a very serious situation. Um, did they underestimate, perhaps, the dangers? Or is that just always part of the risk, do you think, of this kind of expedition? No, I think you could do a better job mitigating the risk. We know from a long history of operating submarines in the Royal Navy, the American Navy, I've been underwater for 87 continuous days. What it takes to keep a submarine operating safely underwater. We have, first of all, starts with the design and the building of the submarine. We track a bolt from when it was manufactured, let say it's chromium magnesium alloy, to when it's installed on the submarine, every step of the way, because we want to make sure that the exact right bolt with the right material is installed in the right bolt hole. This all costs money. And then when we operate the submarine, if we were in port for a while, we don't just go out and submerge in deep water and see how it goes. We, we test everything at the pier, then we go deliberately 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, we walk around with flashlights checking things. It is daunting, and this is why these submarines cost so much money. So I admire people pushing the boundaries, and throughout the human race, these people have contributed a lot. And some risk is unavoidable, but I think you should try and do everything you can to minimise avoidable risk. What, what, David, what do you think is the most likely scenario that's happened here? Well, uh, for the families and friends, prepare yourself for bad news. Uh, no, the communications abruptly ended. 
and the submarine has not shown up on the surface. So to me, that signifies likely that the crew has been incapacitated. It could be simply that the batteries die, but in this case, I would expect to hear someone banging a wrench, for example, against the titanium end bells of the submarine. But we're not hearing anything. So I worry that there's something, there could have been a fire on board, they could have somehow depleted their oxygen way early and not realized it. Uh, they could have flooded somehow, a fitting corroded and ruptured and water came in. And when you're that deep, you said 380 times the pressure at air. That's just a number. It's hard to conceive how f that happens like this. The water would come in so fast, they wouldn't experience anything. They would be crushed, they would be drowned, they'd be asphyxiated, and they would feel no pain. What is the difference between a submarine and a submersible? A submarine has a big motor, a big engine, and a propeller that drives it out of port. So it's on its own, leaves port, uh, leaves Norfolk, goes out to sea, drives a thousand miles, submerges, and, and operates. A submersible has small maneuvering um, pro uh, propellers, so it's towed out to the side of the Titanic, it's released by the mothership, it can drive down, hover around the wreck, uses those propellers, because there's currents down there, so it uses those propellers to make sure it doesn't get swept into the wreck or entangled in the wreck. And then when, when they're done sightseeing and the time's up, then they come back up to the surface. Well, thank you for that expert uh, guidance, too, because I think a lot of people are a little bit confused. Dr. Michael, you know better than most the difference. You've been on a submersible in 2000. You went down there for ABC News. You were the first TV correspondent in history to report from the wreck of the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. We've got a little clip of this, I think. As we approach the stern of the ship, we're suddenly caught up in a strong underwater current that pushes us towards one of the gigantic 21-ton propellers. Oh, my God, look at the size of these things. Oh, my gosh, so are we stuck or what? As this graphic shows, we appear to be somehow wedged beneath the wreck of the stern. A scary moment for you. Uh, does this bring back pretty awful memories of, of what happened to you and what could have happened? Yeah. I, I'm feeling pretty sick right now. And uh, agree with the lieutenant. Uh, the two things that um, come out at me right now is the loss of communications, because even when we were stuck down there, our pilot, who was a, a former Russian MiG pilot, it's piloting our three-man sub, much smaller than the one that's currently in this situation. And uh, he was able to communicate with the surface ship, the research vessel, the Academy Keldish, on the surface. I couldn't understand what they were saying. It was all in Russian, but nevertheless. And then the second thing that uh, stands out uh, to me, Pierce, is, um, as the lieutenant pointed out, if, if it had just been a failure of communications, then that pilot, would have brought that thing up to the surface immediately. So, I mean, uh, we can speculate endlessly. I hate doing it because lives are at stake. Yeah. I'm really sorry. I, I can see exactly what that feels like. It's, uh, yeah, it's I can also see. feel to be stuck under there and a bit utterly hopeless. It's not easy to get out of there. I, I can see the emotion there in you. That this is obviously, and and, and indeed also for you, uh, Yannick. Um, because, Dr. Michael, I guess you must have had a moment when you were in a similar situation where you thought you may not get out of it, right? Yeah, more than a moment, uh, the better part of an hour. And uh, <clears throat> being a scientist, of course, I'm a, a professional problem solver. So my first instinct was, number one, to hope no, nobody in the cabin would panic because we had been told uh, by the captain of our ship before we went down he told us a story, a true story, of a gentleman who was found himself in that situation and in his panic went for the escape hatch to open it up. It's right above your head. And, of course, it was the end of it because, as the, cap, as the lieutenant said, the pressure's down there enormous. Uh, I, I filed a story for 2020 and then Good Morning America. And uh, just to illustrate how uh, powerful the pressure is down there, we took uh, some styrofoam cups and the, the cup came back about that small and all the air had been squeezed out of it from the pressure down there. That brings it home. It's, the, it's a very hostile environment, very cold, very high pressure. Um, so, uh, yes, for the better part of an hour, I kept thinking, well, how could we get out of this? There was another Russian sub in the vicinity, and I thought perhaps it could tow us out. But, of course, 
it's not feasible. It's not AAA comes tow you out of the mud. Um, and I just ran through the checklist of things in my mind. And I finally came to that moment, that brick wall, that utter sense of uh, hopelessness. And the words that came into my mind were, this is how it's going to end for you. And you have to understand, I've been to the North Pole, the South Pole. I've covered the Persian Gulf War for 14 years, ABC News. I've been all over the world. I've been in harm's way everywhere. But those words came into my mind, and I'll never forget them. This is how it's going to end for you. And I thought of my wife, Laurel, and thought I'd never see her again. And just by the grace of God, Victor and his skill managed to weasel her way out of that uh, big propeller. It's a big propeller. Our ship was very small, you have to understand. It's a huge propeller. Our ship is small in comparison. We just got trapped in the blades. But if it weren't for Victor's uh, heroic efforts, I, I wouldn't be here today to tell you about this. But it's just terrible. It makes me sick. Well, incredibly emotive uh, description there uh, from someone who really does know what they may... I mean, look, you had a miracle escape. We can only hope and pray that something may turn up here. We don't know, obviously, what's happened. And until we know for sure, there's hope. And they, they would still have enough oxygen left if, indeed, they're still alive. And we can only hope and pray that does happen. And, and Yannick, for you and for everyone who's a friend, and a family member, our hearts go out to all of you and we just hope and pray that there is a miraculous ending to this. But thank you all very much indeed for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pierce.